This initiative started with blogging, when I started blogging about families, then later we started a platform on families and we started this youth program which is very, very important at this time. This time around we want to know what the challenges the youth are facing and how we can teach them or direct them in coping skills and that is what we're doing today. everyone my name is Fumi so we'll get right to the program I just want to introduce what Agbajawa means so who knows what Agbajawa means I think I won't ask the older people I'll ask the young people the young Yoruba speaking people does anybody want to try together Ron, are you sure nobody gave you that expo <laughs> okay yes Agbajawa like the Yoruba proverb Agbajawa lafin soya putting all hands on deck to help the family. And it was started by Bimbo, Abimbola Shomolu. We started in 2017. Um, the first series was on parents, second series was on um, specifically on fathers. And then the subsequent series have been on young people. And especially in this environment that we're in, a lot of people like to speak at young people and complain about how their, their lives are different and how they don't really understand. But I, I don't think enough of us are doing a lot of listening. And that's what this program is about this evening. We're going to be doing a lot of listening. And like you can see um, on your program, she, all of the panelists are young people. No um, agba lagba, just young people listening and bearing their minds. We're going to play you a short video titled The Challenges We Face. Um, a, a couple of young people are going to talk about some of the challenges, and then we'll have our moderator, Ayatemi Shomolu, come up and introduce the panelists right after the video. A uh, challenge that I faced as a teenager was violent to depression during my secondary school life, because during this time, I cried out to my parents, but I wasn't taken seriously. Mental health was not a priority for Nigerian parents, at this time and my cries for help were seen as me exaggerating my problems or thoughts and this intensified when I was a senior in high school and to make this even more serious I actually was applying and auditioning to schools during this time and thankfully I was able to get into all my schools but this was a very hard battle finally being heard because I had battled this for about four years on my own and finally after like five years I was heard by my family which I'm extremely grateful for. A challenge I faced in life would be like peer pressure and trying to compete with my friends. Like this just made me like laid back, lazy, unserious in school and obviously this led to like my grades started to decline. Like I wasn't doing as well in school. This then hindered my opportunity to school in the UK as my school said I should retake one of the exams I failed in order to get into the school. I just sat with my mom, was prayerful about it. And like, this just made me realize that like, in the real world, you shouldn't just care about what your friends do. You should like, do what you're meant to do instead of saying, oh yeah, my friends are doing this, so let me do this as well. So eventually my school let me in and like, without retaking the exam and like, with, through the help of my mom and God, this just helped me realize the challenges I faced and this incident helped me overcome it. One of the challenges I faced as being a youth was when my sisters went abroad and I was going through things and I had no one to talk to. And the way I overcame it was by actually trusting my parents and talking to the close friends that, were, that I knew were going through the same thing and they actually helped. So. One of the biggest challenges I faced as a teenager is trying to prove myself to adults especially nigerian adults that i'm worthy of something i'm doing because most times they look at age as like oh like he's not like a certain age so he can't know this he can't know that but that's not necessarily the case like 
teenagers could be smarter than adults they could know more than an adult but like I feel like the society like I grew up in like most times people always feel the need to like bring up age as like something like oh like he, you're young like you can't know this you can't know that but like that's not the truth so like one of the battles I face is like trying to prove myself to adults that like no like even if I'm young like I've worked hard to like know certain things and be able to like get certain talents and stuff so like that's one of the biggest things like trying to like just prove that age doesn't mean anything. Being the relatively active teen that I was, I was usually conflicted with having to balance my social and sporting activities with the academic side of being a senior at school. More often than not, I, I went for the more fun option of being outside or being with my friends, as any teen would. Even though I was thriving on the sports field and doing well outside, I saw that my grades were, going, were starting to get affected. Leading up to my final exams, this was a challenge for me because me, myself and everyone around me had high expectations on me to deliver. To cut the long story short, I did eventually deliver thankfully. And I did this by incorporating a daily planner into my life. This planner helped me arrange my days, weeks, even months more appropriately by scheduling time to do different things and do everything at the right time. Although the, it is important to note that the most challenging part of having a planner and being committed is the dedication it requires and the amount of commitment it requires one to put into doing exactly what they had predetermined for themselves initially. I myself found this as the most challenging part, but as I went through it and I did it and I tried my best and I learned and I got over it, I did see myself getting better grades over time and having top grades at the end of my exams. And I also saw myself being a better performer at my sports because I was more regimented in my trainings and I was more exercised and I could exercise better and I used to plan better. And basically the planner just made me see things from a different perspective. And it just allowed me to just be more calculated with my time and be more calculated with the moves I'm making. So I definitely would advise it and I would definitely say this is one way that I faced a challenge for myself and I was able to overcome it. Thank you so much to our media team for putting that amazing video together and thank you guys so much for being here. I'm not gonna waste much of your time, we're gonna go straight to the most interesting part of this event, in my opinion. And I'm going to start by introducing our amazing panelists. Our first panelist for today is Mr. Fiend Austin Peters. Please welcome him onto the stage. Fee is an 18-year-old young man who was head boy at De Waterman College and as well as head captain, Duke of Edinburgh student leader and Red Cross Marshal. He will be heading to the University of Loughborough this fall and hopes to become a successful politician and impeccable leadership skilled individual. <laughs> and next up we have Ms. Joko Tola Phillips. Let's welcome Joko onto stage. Ms. Joko is a creative director of Joko Edu, uh, her accessories line, which she started after being inspired to create sustainable leather goods. Additionally, she volunteers at the Victoria Island Secondary School, teaching government courses and SS2 students. Next up, we have Dolapo Akingbolagbe, a 22-year-old University of Essex graduate where she studied criminology. She's passionate about human rights and youth advocacy. Please welcome Dolapo. <laughs> Next up, we have Aladu Adedeji Mabieku, a 25-year-old graduate of the University of Central Lancashire, I hope I pronounced that right, where he studied psychology and music production. He's passionate about his music career as an audio technician and artist. Next up, we have Ms. Ayodala Shomolu, a 17-year-old lady starting her freshman year at the University of Miami this fall. She will be majoring in economics and minoring in Spanish. She's passionate about public speaking, music, art, and other forms of expression. She believes that freedom of expression should be a vital part of every household. Please welcome Ayodala Shomolu. 
Last but definitely not least, a few of you who've been here you will remember him from the last youth speaker, Mr. Tolulok Bayashemowo, a 15-year-old who actually started his education as a preschooler with us at Playhouse Children's Center. He attended Green School for Elementary and is currently at Green Spring Secondary School. He enjoys swimming, basketball, writing, and has recently discovered his passion for public speaking. So let's please welcome our amazing panelists. And then there's me, Ayatemi Shemulu, your moderator. Hi, guys. So I was recently having a conversation with a friend of mine. He's a young father, very modern day father. And he was saying something along the lines of, it's unreasonable for me to send my children overseas, you know, in the Western world, and, you know, have them have, live most of their life there, get educated there and expect them to come back without inheriting some Western world traits. So Dalapa, being someone who spent most of her life in England, what's your take on this? Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. I think my experience was kind of different because although I was born and raised in England, my parents are very traditional Yoruba parents. So even in the house, I wasn't allowed to speak English. So I had to speak Yoruba. So I think in that sense, my experience was different. Um, so the four walls of my house was, I guess, Elisha. But then the rest of the world was, <laughs> was England and was London. So, yeah. Awesome. So, Ms. Joko, for you, being someone who's spent a lot of time in Nigeria, do you feel like students who go overseas and come back, do, they, do you think that they come back a little too westernized? Do you think that modern youth who travel abroad you know, go back and just inherit a little too much of the Western world, basically? I think it depends. Mm -hmm. So I graduated from university in 2010. I went to school in the States. And I moved back to Nigeria in 2011. I've been, moving, I've been living here since. So what I would say is, first of all, you would go through reverse culture shock, which seems a little bit odd because you're like, this is my home now. I know everything. I know how to do things. But you would have that initial clash with your parents. I think there's certain underlying values that you just have to keep, you know, things that your parents have taught you. But then it's also good to learn some um, certain things that you've brought from where they sent you, because there's a reason why they sent you there. They know that you were going to pick up certain things from where they sent you. So it's also a little bit contradictory to say, ah, you're too Western, why are you like this? But there's also a line, because I know when I first came back, sometimes I was also a little bit extra. So there were some things that I had to curb and be like, you know what, your parents are not going to get this. It's, um, so there's, I think you have to just find the fine balance of the two. That's what I would say. Awesome, thank you. Now, Fee, as <laughs> you're, going, you're heading over to the University of Loughborough in fall, what is it that you're looking forward to most about you know, going to university in another country, you know, starting life? Uh, you know, a different stage because high school and college are two completely different things. So what is this, what is it you're looking forward to most about this next step? To be fair, I think what I'm most focused on or what I want the most is to more or less make a name for myself. So I want to be more of an independent person. I don't want to focus on, oh, my mom has money, my father has money. I want to do things for myself. So um, in high school, I was in a more, you know, closed environment. But coming to university, I'm on my own, you know, I make decisions by myself. I decide whether I need to go to university, whether it's important for me. So I need to make decisions that would actually, you know, impact my life. So I need to be clear on what is most, most important for me. I know what will benefit me. So I need to more or less think like a man and not like a child anymore. So it's like a transition from turning into it from, from a child and turning into a man. So, you know, things are different. I can't be saying I want to go to a party every day. You know, I have to focus on my books. I have to focus on my sports life. I have to focus on God, you know, the, the key important things in my life, yeah. Awesome, you seem like a very responsible young man, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, but um, the first thing I got out, I got a lot of, from what you said, and the first thing that I got out of that was independence. So, Tulip, I'm going to ask you this, being, in Nigeria for most of your life, how do you think that has affected your perception of freedom? You know, freedom in the sense of, you know, with adults, with parents, with family, like, what's your, how has being Nigerian affected your sense of freedom in a positive or negative way? What's your experience? 
Freedom, like, if you're talking about freedom to speak or freedom to say what I want, I feel like in Nigeria, people in my age, we just, they tell us things, and we have to do that thing. But then, if it's for my parents specifically, then my parents happen to be the more understanding um, Nigerians. Like, I can tell them, oh, I want to do this, or this is this. And because I always have like a sound reasoning, they've grown to at least allow me have the freedom to say what I want to say, rather than it just being do this because I told you to do this. But I feel like I don't have the best perspective on this because my parents and those traditional Nigerian parents, like, eh, will you shut up? I told you to do something. You're asking me a question back. You're not even done doing it. So, yeah, I feel like the way I've been raised, I have a lot of freedom in that. And I, they've, like, taught me when I'm going too far with the freedom. Like, if there are some things that when you're told, you should actually just, just do it. If you have something to say, say after you're done doing it. But, yeah, I feel like we have a good enough freedom in that aspect. That's awesome. Um, I'll still um, ask you this, um, direct this question at you, Tolu. So what advice, I know you didn't necessarily experience this, but to someone who is a young child who feels you know, trapped in their household, like their parents aren't listening to them, their parents aren't giving them enough freedom in the sense of speaking and even in the sense of and going out with their friends and such things, what would you say to that child directly? I feel like it depends on your parents. If you know that your parents can actually listen to you at a point, then it's just about like, over time, when you try and explain to them, if they see that, oh, this boy is actually making sense, next time they'll be like, okay, let me listen to him a bit more. Then over time, they become more free. But if your parents are just like, you know, like full Nigeria, and they grew up in the village, they won't listen to you at all, then look for somebody outside that can help you talk to them. Like, if you have that uncle that escaped the village for some time, <laughs> they can just tell him, oh, like, I'm... 18, you know, let me, let me leave the house without having to do all of this or just let me explain. Even if you want to correct me or say I'm wrong, allow me to explain. So someone from outside that you think can understand you, you can talk to them and then they can talk to your parents for you. Uh, just uh, also remember to mind the tone of how you speak because for Nigerians, tone is more important than what you actually say. <laughs> so... Like, if I say, um, mom, come on, you should allow me to do this. And I say, mom, I allow you to do this thing now. It's the same words, but then your tone really differs. Like, it, depends, it, they, it changes what they say. So the tone of words and the way people are, the way things are said really matters. Yeah. Thank you so much, Halilaka. Ayaza, Paul, you'll be heading to the University of Miami in fall. You know, I... Um, just graduated from the University of Miami and I remember as I was heading there and I told my parents and you know uh, aunties and uncles I was heading to the University of Miami they said I'm oh, Miami you know what is it you're going to do in Miami and all sorts so what do you have to say to those people who hear that you're going to the University of Miami and they're like why Miami when I told some people I was going to the University of Miami most of them were like oh so you're going to party that type of thing I mean it's part of the college experience to party so it's not like I'm not going to go out or anything but um, at the end of the day, if you know who you are, no matter the environment you're in, you're still going to stand your ground. Um, I know, like, I, I'll always have the morals that my parents have instilled in me, so I'm not going to go off, but I'm still going to experience it because, like, people say, college is meant to be the best four years of your life, so I'm still going to enjoy myself regardless, but I'm still going to go there and do what I'm going there to do. Awesome. So all the young kids out there, just stand your ground. Remember the home that you come from. Remember the things that your parents taught you. And no matter where you go, like you said, just hold on to those, you know, things that your parents taught you. Now over to Laju. You um, stud got, um, studied music in college. What was your experience? Because I know a lot of people apparently in Nigeria, they want you to be lawyers, doctors, and the likes. So how did you feel when you were going to study music? Did you get support from your family system and friends and Nigeria? I see you laughing, so I'm looking forward to your answer. Um, to be honest, at first, I was bombarded with the normal response of music is a lazy man's job, mm. which was very, very disheartening, to be honest, because you'd want, you know, this is something you're chasing, you're 
passionate about it and everyone's telling you it's a lazy man's thing but they're not willing to sit down with you when you're going through the stress of trying to write a song or trying to mix a track or trying to create an instrumental. They're not there. They don't know the stress you're going through where 24-7 you're trying to perfect something that you've done. And they, all they do is they come up to you and they only see the people who are on TV or who go out and they say, oh, it's a lazy man's thing. And that was very painful. But at a point in time, after doing everything I had to do on my own and working a bit and everything, they sort of got the understanding that, okay, fine, it's not, he's not joking about this. He wants to do this. So the best we can do is to support him, even though they spent like 20-something years making it feel bad, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Well, yeah, you, you, you know, you, it's you past. Right. So. Yeah. So basically what I'm getting from that is that it, it seems sort of heartbreaking when you're passionate about something and you're not receiving support, you know. So what would you say to those um, youth and even young adults who want to study something just because their parents want them to study or want to go to a certain school because their parents want them to or they feel pressure to accept a certain job because that's what society wants them to. What do you have to say to that person? Well, from my personal experience, what I'll say is if your parents are telling you to go and study something because they think it's going to be better for you, it's good to get the extra knowledge, but at the same time, don't, you know, don't drop what you're passionate about. I mean, there are people who are you know, who studied law or study computer science but do fashion or do photography, these people know that, yes, fine, I can learn these things on the side, but at the same time as I'm learning this, I can still practice what I am passionate about. So if I graduate, when I graduate, hello, mommy, daddy, here's the graduation form, here's the certificate tickets, I'm going to go and focus on what I want to go and do. I mean, just, you know, that was how I thought back then, but at a point in time, I realized that even with what I'm doing, the psychology I learned kind of plays a part with it because you need to understand what people are thinking when you want to create something for them to enjoy. So yeah, it kind of goes hand in hand. Awesome, thank you, Laju. Now back to you, Fim. In your bio, um, God Fearing Man was one of the first things that I noticed. Now, as a young man who you know has a relationship with God, how has that affected you as a person? How has that you know hmm. affected your lifestyle, your experiences? What does that relationship with God do for you? Like I said in my bio, I'm a God, <laughs> I'm a God fearing um, child. I was raised up in a home where you know I went to church regularly, and <clears throat> I was taught how to pray, taught how to you know go through the process of praise and worship and all of that. And obviously, as a youth. You go through different experiences, you have different types of friends, you know, you get to a stage in which you're, you start going for parties, you know, you're getting exposed to different things in life, you're starting to know new things, you're learning. So over the, t over the time, it just becomes in inevitably difficult to balance your, you know, your religious life and trying to more or less, you know, please the crowd or fit in the social circle. So. Um, I'm a kind of person who, when I'm around my friends, you know, I want to be cool, you know, I want to do this and that, I want to talk to people, and you know, I just want to be free around my friends. And, you know, there's some times where it's difficult to try and get that balance and get that compromise in terms of being religious and, you know, trying to, you know, go beyond the, um, the line in which, you know, this is wrong. So I think the most important thing is just, you know, having that line that no matter what you do, no matter who you're with, you must always stand on your values. And I think that's the most important thing, your values, you must always keep that in mind. So regardless of whoever you're with, and speaking about who you're with, your friends and your company should be as important, you know, if you're a God-fearing individual. So like, I like to, you know, go to church, I like to sing, I like to, you know, do praise and worship. As a youth, Regardless of who I'm with, regardless of what I do, regardless of where I go, I try to keep in mind, you know, remember the home you're from, remember the God you serve, and just, you know, focus on 
what you do, focus on your relationship with God and never focus. So like, I think the most important thing is just keeping like a more or less timetable or like a, a pattern, like, you know, a praying pattern. So at this certain time, obviously there'll be flexibility, there'll be a certain time you just want to pray or something, but like just keeping a certain time in which, oh, at this time I have to pray, at this time I have to do like 30 or 25 minutes of praise and worship, you know, stuff like that. And even when I play football, I've never played a football match in which before the beginning of the game, I don't kneel down and pray to God. I don't have a performance in which before I get on stage, I pray to God. So it's just, it's just something I, you know, keep in mind that no matter what I do, it's God first. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like it's so important, especially in this point in our life where, you know, there's so much going on. So many distractions, so many options for, you know, people want to get into, you know, drug, sex and other things that are inappropriate just to, you know, give them that release. But your prayer life is the number one thing, you know, it's a solid ground, it's a safe space. So I definitely encourage a lot of you to find that, you know, relationship with God, find that personal quiet time where you express yourself. If you can't express yourself to friends, you can't express yourself to certain family members, you know, express yourself to God. Joko first. You run a blog in which you write a lot of different things, um, including about your faith. How do you hope this blog affects you know, people that are reading it? What impact do you expect this book to have, um, the faith aspect of it? I'm hoping it will inspire people. So I gave my life to Christ three years ago. Uh, I think I was 27 at the time. But I grew up in a Christian home, so I went to church every Sunday. You know that thing where your mother will drag you along, you have no choice. Because when I first came back, actually, we used to fight about it all the time. We were living in Lekki. My parents were going to this time in Keja. They were living at night, as far as I was concerned, because they would leave at 6 a.m. I'm like, I'm not following you to church at 6 a.m. to make 7 a.m. service. But, you know, after going through some challenges when I moved back, and I tried so many different approaches and it didn't work, that's when I gave my life to Christ. And what I really share on my blog is my own personal story, my personal experience. And I'm hoping that it would inspire people. Sometimes the deepest things that you think, ah, I can't share this, it's too personal, it's too, you know, those are the things where people really reach out to you. So I'm just hoping that it will inspire people and push people to do beyond what they think that they can do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joker. That's honestly very inspiring for me, and I'm sure it's inspiring for a lot of other people. You see, like, like she said, there's a lot of things that we're fearful to share because we're like, what people say, you know, they would judge me and things like that. But you'll be so shocked the amount of people that are experiencing those things, and that's why we're all here today, because each of us carries something, you know? And we can't just, that lie that we carry, we can't just keep it to ourselves. No matter how, you know, dark your past may have been, is you are definitely an inspiration to someone. So why we're all here is for the youth, don't be afraid to share things. You know, don't be afraid to share your story, the challenges that you experienced, because it's definitely going to have an impact on a lot of other people's lives. Now, Ayodalapo, what do you believe are the effects of having regular gatherings with family? It could be prayer gatherings, it could be just casual lunch, it could be anything. What, what impact do you believe that has? Why do you think people should do it? Why do you think they shouldn't, if that's what you believe? What's your take? So, I think having gatherings as a family like creates a sense of unity. It makes you know that... Um, Regardless, you have people there, you have a community you can fall back on, um, you have people you can always speak to, the people that are there for you, because when you gather around as a family and the things that you speak about, like let's say you're going through something, because personally, um, through high school, there were so many problems that I went through, and I felt like no one really had, like, I felt alone, basically, but a point in time, because I'm, I'm the type of person who, if I don't speak about things to somebody, I'm going to like just get overwhelmed with emotion. I'll, I'll just be doing something at the end of the day, I'll just start crying. And I'm like, why am I crying? But that's because over time, I've kept things in. I haven't spoken to anyone about those things. And I feel like that's one of the things that just makes you very sad for no reason, you know, things like that. So um, at the point in time, I just started going to my family group chat because I was schooling abroad. I was going to my family group chat. And I'll just type everything, like, oh, like how I'm feeling, what just happened, da 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 And I'll just put it there. And like, I don't even care if anyone responds or not, but just the fact that I know that someone is there reading and listening to me, you know? And I feel like if my family wasn't the type of family who, you know, regularly we speak together, you know, we have like meetings and stuff like that, I won't really feel like 
there's a point of doing that because I'll still feel alone. And that really helped because not only did I have a place to rant about my emotions, but they actually listened to me. They made me feel better. And yeah, so I feel like it just creates um, a sense of unity when you speak to your family. Yeah, I definitely agree, especially with a lot of us, you know, being, you know, in boarding school or going to school overseas, we need that connection, you know, we need to know that, oh, a friend is there, a family member is there, so we shouldn't underestimate the power of, you know, just a phone call or just a, hey, come to the supermarket with me or let's just take a walk, those little things, honestly, it's so vital in relationships. Um, so, Lopper, I don't know your experience, you know, in the household with, you know, nannies and sorts, but I heard a lot in Nigeria that people, certain families have a lot of staff come and go, drivers, nannies and all that. How do you think this affects a child, you know, growing up having like 15 different nannies in your life, you know, two drivers, you know, this and then cooks come and go, like how does that affect a child mentally, emotionally, socially? Well, we also have staff in our house, and like I grew up with them, I grew up with the nanny there, or the cook there, or something like that. But I don't really feel like it had any bad effects. Like if you, if your parents, like your parents know what they're doing, they don't just see someone on the street and say, you, you're a nanny now. Mm -hmm. They like have people that they know, they trust people, the people that they trust, and they bring them to you. Your parents are never going to bring somebody that they don't fully trust to take care of you. So the nannies I grew up with, they were really nice people. And when they left, I was actually sad. Like every time I would just see another random one, like, ah, who is this? Where is someone, you know? So your parents know what they're doing. And I don't feel like, unless there's any, you've had any bad situation with any of them, you just do what you do. You live, and then they do what they're meant to do. And the way some people, some of them were very nice people and they taught me things that I haven't learned from anywhere else. You have something to say, please. Um, I also think it depends on your nurturing and the examples your parents show. If you're nurtured in a respectful manner, you know, you're taught you should not disrespect your elders and you should, regardless of whether they're working for you, you know, you should give them adequate respect because they're human beings just like you. And also, it also depends on the examples your parents and, you know, your guardians show. Because if you are your child and you're seeing your mom or dad shouting, insulting this, you know, security, you're a foolish boy, you're an idiot, you know, it doesn't set a good precedent for you as a, as a child. So those things definitely come into effect, definitely. Thank you. Uh, I've noticed that in some parent, um, families, especially with much younger children, it seems like the child is much closer to the staff, you know, much closer to the nanny. Why do you think this happens? Anyone can answer this. Sometimes, in certain cases, when the child is closer to the nanny or the staff, it's because there's usually, well, the parents aren't really there per se. You know, there's certain things that the staff, like the nanny would be there for the child for, you know, like going to pick the child up from school or sometimes in, let's say, teenage years, in some cases, where the nanny acts like an older sibling, listens, you know, gives advice based on their experiences about certain things. They may not have, no, they may not have all the experiences the parents might have, but there are some things they have gone through so they can give advice on these things. That builds a closeness between the younger child and the staff member. Um, that, but that's some cases, you know. In other cases, it depends on how they, in other cases, it depends on how empathic the child is. Some children feel like, you know what, you're working with my parents and you already have it hard enough, so might as well, make, you know, might as well try to make your job a little easier by, you know, talking to you as a normal person, not as a staff, you know. So rather than saying, ah, this person, go and do this, you'd be like, oh, auntie this, can you help me with this? Oh, uncle this, can you help me with that? You know, basically treating them like you're part of the, like they're part of the family. Um, I feel like children just need someone there from an early age. I can't remember where I learned psychology. Um, there's a point in time in a child's life that they need to make an attachment to someone. So whoever is there for them, whoever is listening, whoever is giving them attention is the person that they'll be most attached to. So if their parents who are barely at home, you know, then staff are the people doing everything for the kids, that's who they're going to find a connection with and rely on for different things. So I think that comes into like, Whoever is giving them attention, whoever is there for them, ends up being closer to That's them. That's a very interesting way to even dive into our next topic. You know, like you said, there comes a time where you just need that attention, you just need that affection from whoever is there. So a lot of youth, which this is something the parents hate, a lot of youth go to social media. 
And there's a lot of net pros and cons to social media and all that. So, Lope, what's your take on parents who say, you know, for my child, absolutely no Twitter, no Instagram, no, I don't want to see you on your phone when I'm around, none of that. What's your take? Well, I don't really use social media like that much or that actively. But then for parents that say no completely, I feel like some people or some children don't get the no. Like if they say no um, phone when we're having a family meeting, now it makes sense. Like you can't be talking to outside people when you're meant to be having something close to your family. That's a no that makes sense. But if it's no, like no, you're not even getting a phone, you're not getting this, then I feel like you're just restricting your children. Because Nigeria has its information. The country abroad has its information. So with something as simple as Snapchat, you see, or someone random, like just make a friend abroad, you're getting out of their information. It's to your detriment to not allow your children meet other people that can give them so much information. Like a lot of the things I know have just been random YouTube videos or a random post I see on Instagram. So it's like, you're just, you would pay so much for a lesson teacher, but then you won't give them the, the, the it's, no, it's no expense to you, except maybe your internet is very expensive to let them download your, the app and get the information. It's not, to any cost to, it's not any cost to you to just let them get information from people. There are some things that if you ask and ask and ask, you can't just get it in Nigeria because they don't experience that thing in Nigeria. When you get it abroad, you get that information. Now you have a smarter child. You have a child that is not just that Nigerian boy, but that Nigerian boy with information from UK, information from here, information from there. And I feel like it makes sense to put a limit on it. You have to restrict it. You can't let them be on social media all day, 24 seven. But then if you don't allow it at all, then you're just not letting your child be as knowledgeable as they can be. Um, I just wanted to reiterate on what Tulupa said. Um, we kind of live in a global village now, so it would kind of be irresponsible for you to completely restrict your children from social media, especially when a lot of people make a lot of money from it in today's society. So, um, like you said, yeah, so it's it really important that the children have social media, but it's restricted to a certain extent. I was going to say what Dolapo just said. I actually think it's okay for parents to restrict it. When I was in secondary school, it was TV. You can't watch TV during the week. And you didn't switch on the TV. Because I find that we're spending too much time on social media these days. Me personally, I love Instagram. So I delete it on Sunday evenings, and I put it back on Friday evenings. Because I realized that, oh, I'll control my screen time 30 minutes. But then I'm like, ah, I missed that post. So it's just better I don't see it during the week at all. And apart from that, it has so many, it's fantastic, but it has a lot of negative side effects as well. I mean, I was talking to somebody who was telling me, my younger cousin who said she had social anxiety. I was like, what is social anxiety? Because she was going to be seeing people face to face and they had to interact, but I couldn't understand what she was talking about. So for her, it's like, I would rather talk to you on my phone and by text, not even calling you. Like maybe text, chat or something. So I think it's actually okay to restrict social media so that you can develop, you know, other skills as well. Something I forgot also, um, my mom was telling me about how it's very important for you to have connections and know people because they can help you in the future. Anyone can help you. If you don't let your children have the social things that they use to make and keep friends, even the closest friends that they have when they're growing up, if they can't keep in touch with them and keep talking to them, then they've alienated themselves and they don't have those people that could help them in future. So that's another thing to why you need to let your children have social media. I really agree with Tolu with the whole idea of connection because um, the world we live in now is quite competitive and unfortunately everything is about connection. And I don't know, social media, I'm, like for instance Twitter now, I've met so many different types of people, you know, from different religions, different parts of the world that I haven't even ever seen before. And, you know, we, we, you know, we talk on Twitter and then we set up meeting points and meeting areas and stuff like that. So just the idea of the global connectivity, you know, getting to know new people, you know, getting to know new information. There's this account on Twitter called, I think, Life Hacks or something like that. And, you know, the videos I see on this Life Hacks is just, it's just, it's amazing because obviously I wouldn't learn these things in real life. So me going on Twitter and seeing these kind of videos is extremely inspiring. But at the same time, there's a negative side to everything. 
And personally, I feel like the best way you can learn from things is from experiences. So if you necessarily see something that is wrong and you, know, you take from it, then you can learn from that. And yeah, so I agree with the idea of restriction because obviously everything needs to be restricted. And too much of everything is not good because you know, we're all students and we have work and stuff like that. And if you're on your phone 24 seven, where's the time for you know, studying? So yeah. Um, I also believe that there should be a balance, like was it Dorfer that said this? Um, because there are some times that personally, I know I can be very dramatic, but um, let's say I haven't been getting notifications on my phone and like, I feel like I'm not getting attention, that no one really cares about me in the moment because like, when you're so attached to your phone and that's where all your relationships are, your connections are, if no one is giving you that like, on your phone, you get to start... So you start to get, you know, to feel somehow about things. And it just, it makes it harder for you to interact with people. Because I've had um, some people that, you know, I met on social media and stuff like that. When I see them in person, it's kind of awkward. Because, like, I know this person from social media. So I don't even know how to explain it. But, yeah, I feel like there should be some restrictions. There's some times that I just need to put my phone away and, like, just do something. Because I'm just looking at my phone, waiting for someone to text me, that type of thing. And I feel like it's very unhealthy. Very unhealthy, yeah. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to round up this session. But you're going to have the opportunity to ask questions. So start to think of the questions that you want to hear from us. Before we round up, I would like each one of you to share. You know, it could be what, you have one minute to share, like a piece of advice or a certain challenge that you face about anything. It could be anything. We will start with Tilde Lockwear and then we'll go straight on. Okay, so what I'll talk about is how we relate with our parents. Um, parents can be very difficult, but I've realized that we can also be very difficult too. So we have to know how to balance it. Like one thing I found really annoying is I'm 15, and I think 15, 16, 17, these ages are perfect for parents to just like, like have you ever had your parents say, you're 15, you should be doing this? So that puts the mental image that, oh, okay, I'm an, I'm an aged person, I should be able to do this, fine, I'll take this responsibility. Then you say, oh, I want to take an Uber alone to this place. You're like, no, you're just 15, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, so on the surface, it may just seem like this person is just annoying. Why are you, you're changing it, you're, you're saying I'm too old, now you're saying I'm too young. That can be annoying. But then I've learned that deep down, you have to look past the fact that it's annoying. You have to look past the fact that sometimes it just doesn't make sense at all. You have to know that your parents are always doing it for the best. And I'm not a parent yet, <laughs> but when you're a parent, you realize that there's some things that you would do and you're like, this doesn't make sense. So, but if you now get hurt, it's my wahala. So you realize that they're doing it for your, for your best interest and because they love you at heart. So just take that in mind. The next time your friend does something, they are like, does, that doesn't make sense to you. When you tell children to do something and they ask you, okay, I'm not necessarily saying that, them saying why is like, because I understand when I tell my little sister to do something and she asks me why, like it's sometimes annoying, like why are you asking me why? Like just do it. But... It's kind of, it gives you an opportunity to let the children understand where you're coming from because there have been many times my mom has told me, don't do this, don't do that, and I'm like, <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, like, I don't, like, I don't even get what I mean, like, okay, they tell you don't do this, you're still going to do it at the end of the day because, like, everyone's doing it, but at a point in time, um, my mom started giving me examples of things that have happened to her when she did this or like, you know, things like that. So I feel like when you let your children understand where exactly you're coming from, it makes it like better. Like, okay, so this happened to her when she did this. Okay. But I feel like many parents are scared that, oh, if I tell them this, they'll know that I used to do this when I was young. But it's all part of it. Like, it, make, it brings you closer to your child. If my mom lets me know that, oh, when she was young, she did the same things that I'm doing, and this is how it turned out, it will make me, you know, understand it more and not want to do it, rather than you just saying no. Like, I'm still going to do it. Like, you need to give me a valid reason. Like, that's the sad truth. Like, I don't think parents understand that. So, children are still going to do these things. You need to let them understand where you're coming from. If you don't let them understand where you're coming from, they're still going to do it. So, yeah, I feel like just telling, letting, giving your children, like, anecdotes to things that have happened in your life when this happened, I feel like that really helps. So, that's something parents should start doing. 
Um, okay, so before I give my advice, I'd like to ask a question to everybody, including us panelists here. Um, who here has ever been compared to someone else? If you have, just raise your hand up. All right, great. Now, who here, uh, whose parents have ever compared them to someone they know in the family, by chance? Great. So, my advice is simple, and it cuts across everybody here. Never make a comparison. Because fact is, what makes you as a person unique is not the same thing with the second person you're trying to compare your child or yourself to. Now, I'm coming, at my, I'm coming at this from a personal experience where I've actually been compared to my cousins or being compared to people in school, and those things used to hurt. The thing is, I get where, your par I get where as parents where they're coming from that, look, if this person is succeeding, why can't you? I understand that, but you're not taking into consideration that what this person does might not work for me. You need to understand where I'm coming from, where things work for me, and then help me to build on that, rather than telling me to copy A or B because they, they seem to be getting A's all the time. I mean, as a, ch as a young person, you can imagine how you're chasing this and then your parents are like, ah, this person in your school is getting A's and you're getting C's and B's. Can't you, do, can't you do what they're doing? And then you wonder to yourself, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to do what this person is doing and, it's what, and that's what's getting me these B's and C's. Why don't you help me find out what works for me to get my A's? And I can assure you that the A's you want me to get, I will get them constantly. That's my advice. Yeah. Thank you, Laji. You, you told us to mention a challenge that we're currently facing. So I'm just going to kind of shortly talk about the kind of challenge that I think I'm facing right now, which is that I moved to Nigeria to complete my NYSC. So it's the first time I'm ever living in Nigeria, and I guess when I first decided to make this decision, my parents were like, you want to move to Nigeria? What do you know? Who do you know there? But um, So the challenge that I'm facing is making this decision on whether or not I should stay here or move back to England. So, And any advice I have for the young people in the room is just take chances, take risks. That's what life is all about. Um, and live life and make new experiences. That's what I'm doing. So. Okay, so for the first advice I have for parents is um, be a friend, but also be a parent. Because when your children get older, you enjoy that. My mom is really enjoying it. My dad is jealous. <laughs> so it's, um, I think it's very important because the older you get, the more you realize, I mean, I call my mom for the most random things because I know that she can relate to some of the things that I am going through. So it's very important. Another advice that I have also for parents is that allow your children to make mistakes. Obviously, I'm, I'm not saying that you should watch them entering the hole and say, oh, yeah, ain't tao. But I think you should allow them to make some mistakes. And then you talk them through it. So one of the examples I was going to say earlier in response to something someone said, my first semester in uni, I got a 2.666 GPA. I can never forget because of that antichrist number itself. And I remember thinking, eh? They're not paying dollars for me to come and get 2.666 on a 4.0 scale. But when I spoke to my parents about it, I think their response is what made me do well for the rest of the three and a half years that I was there. My parents didn't take it like, ah, what kind of rubbish were you doing? Is this what we sent you for? You know, they were very understanding. More under, they were less harsh on me than I was on myself. And they told me that I should take it easy, I should relax. And subsequently, I don't think I got a GPA lower than 3.5 and I'll be on the dean's list. So I think it's very important to allow your children to make mistakes. Encourage them, help them, because that's what would actually help them improve. Thank you, Joko. Um, I think my advice for parents today is Nigerian parents need to be more accepting, understanding, and you know, focus on the idea of tolerance. Now, I'm gonna talk about academics and education, for instance. Nigerian parents don't seem to understand, not even Nigerian parents alone, parents in general, need to understand that not every child is the same child. You can't expect your child to have the same academic intellectuality as his friend or his classmate. You can't judge a fish by his ability to climb a tree. It's like a doctor prescribing the same medication for everyone. It can't work. It cannot work. So you need to understand that each child has their own talent, whether it's music, whether it's being a bouncer, whether it's being, a, whether he wants to go to the military, whether he wants to, you know, whatever it is. It's about accepting whatever your child wants to do and tolerating him. 
because they know why they want to do. They have their passions. Luckily for me, unfortunately for me, I have a mother who is extremely accepting in terms of, you know, focusing on what I want to do. My mother is there. Can we give her a round of applause, please? So in terms of music, in terms of, you know, drama, I have an extremely supporting mother, you know, who tells me, whatever you want to do, as far as you put God in it, and as far as you focus your, on your academics, then I, I'm in complete support with you. So we just need to learn to accept our children. And I'm sure most parents don't want to hear this, but tolerance is key. Thank you very much. <laughs> Round of applause for our panelists, please. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. Now I'm just going to get on to introduce the brains behind Bimbo Family Affairs, Ms. Abimbola Shomolu. Her genuine passion and love for children turned this lawyer into a trusted and experienced family counselor, educator, and writer. She has over 25 years experience in teaching and coordinating young children. She established Playhouse Children's Center, Playhouse Ventures, and Bimbo Family Affairs. Ms. Abimbo Shomalu is an exceptional mother, wife, friend, sister, blogger, and so much more. Honestly, she is my definition of a superwoman. So please welcome Ms. Abimbala Shomolu. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming here. We could all be somewhere else, but this is the core of our life. Our children are an extension of our lives. And it's very important that we focus on what is very important. There was a day I was driving from Ojota to Maryland. And there was traffic. You know how Lagos traffic is. I could see so many cars in front of me. And I was in a rush to get somewhere. And I felt a bit agitated because of the traffic. And I almost went frantic because of that traffic. But within myself, I just thought, why am I getting frantic? Yes, many cars are in front. Why don't you focus on where you are and just take it easy until you get to where you're going? So I decided to put on the radio. I decided to take it one step at a time. And there was a time I was even having conversations with the hawkers. So I, I removed the focus from the traffic and focus on my now and everything around me. The amazing thing was that when I looked at the time, when I got to where I was, it took me just about five or 10 minutes in that traffic. But if I did not focus on where I was and get distracted, play music, converse with people, I would lose myself, I would just get frantic. And that's what life is all about. It's about challenges. There's so many things that we see in life because of the way our mind is. We're so much in a hurry to get things done and it has to be done this way and everything. And at times we really have to shift focus from where we're going to the now. Probably I made the day of one of the hawkers, maybe just having a conversation with them, taking myself away from myself and just having a chat with somebody who will think that, okay, is in a fine car but cannot communicate. We had a bit of laugh. Then I was listening to the music and so on. I could have taken a detour. You know how we are in Lagos, take a bend and somewhere. And I'll go off my way and probably find my way out. But I will have lost the time I was supposed to spend with the people that I needed to give a bit of myself to and that. Why am I saying that? The youth have to know that life is full of challenges. There's nobody here that is not facing one challenge or the other. And that's what makes us who we are. We can't give up on ourselves. We can't let things frazzle us and get swamped into where we're going. Maybe parents will start to start to talk to children about their own experiences, to share their experiences that what you're facing, I faced it. And you know what? Sister Lagbaja faced it. You can even go and have a chat with her. She'll tell you what it is. Because many of the youth now give up easily. They feel it's about me, it's happening to me, nobody understands, but it's not about you. Everything that we all face is about life. 
It's about once we face it, we look for coping skills. How do we cope? Who are the people that have been through this? How do they cope? And once we can converse with people and share ideas with them, then we know that, okay, I have the right support system. Everybody here is a support system, whether you're a youth or a parent. My children advise me. They tell me things. They tell me, mommy, this and that. If you can educate your children, then you can, must be able to be proud to, for them to give you advice. It's very important we also realize that. If you are sending your children to school, that means you want them to be able to think and reason. So parents, let's share our stories with our children. Don't let, us think, let them think that we don't go through things every day. Let them know what we face at work today and the decisions we had to take. You'll be amazed. Like Omar Folari said, the one that said something about my people think we're too young. They're not too young. A child once is born is detached from you. He has a, is a spirit with a body that has a soul. You are just a conduit pipe which that child came to the earth. And if you don't do your part, guess what? Somebody else will do it for you. So why not enjoy those days later in years that we can look back and say, I spent time with this child. I connected with this child. I was there with this child. Because guess what? When we're old, they are the ones that are going to spend that time with us. So parents, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunties, we're going back to those days where your mother is my mother. Your father is my father. The world is chaotic. We cannot mind our business again. What happens to one happens to all. You might say it's Dagbaja's person. It is coming to us. I'm not cursing. I'm not cursing, but that is the truth. Things are happening in our homes, in our families. And we have to start to get things right. Once we get the family right, the society will be better. And guess what? It starts from you. It starts from you. It starts from you. It starts from you. We need Agba Jowo to say, yes, I stood by her. I stood by my cousin. My sister did not have a story, but I will share my story. My brother did not have a story, that I will share my story. So if you don't have a story, send them to the homes that have stories that they can share. Some of you have neighbors around you. Your children are your children. Your driver's children are your children. Your neighbor's children are your children. If you see them doing something right, call them back. I see you. I am watching you. Don't fold your arms. But guess what? Wherever your children are, in Cameroon, Canada, somebody is seeing them and folding their arms. I remember when my children were going abroad. I said, if you go somewhere and you do anything and nobody says anything, they don't love you. But if you go somewhere and people, and you, the people, the aunties that say, and tell you and say, don't do this and pull your ears, they love you. We are Africans. There's some things we must not tolerate. There's some things we must not do. Yes, the world has changed, but have we changed? The last time I said it, I am Nigerian by birth, African by origin, a citizen of the world. I take my roots wherever I go. And that is what we need to share with our children. So on that note, I want us to be changed when we leave this place. I want to lots to know that there are things that are so important than those riches, those houses, and those things out there. Children, they are heritage. The future is now. So if we don't plan, and the country is not planning, then there's chaos. Let's start. It's not the whole world. Let's start from the people that are here. Be your brother's keeper. Very important. So on that note, I just want to tell you something that the children, they want to run. We want to walk. But we can agree to what? Jog. That's understanding. They have foresight. We have insight. They have energy. Guess what we have? Stability. They have knowledge. They're very, our children, they've gone around the world. There's some things, even the internet gives them knowledge. But guess what we have? Wisdom. So we need one another. They don't have it all. We don't have it all. We need each other. Thank you very much. But um, today, um, questions are going to go to our panelists. Please, a round of applause to our panelists. 
the people I've called here today, because um, there's some things we need to start to talk about. I know that there are professionals that can help us. We have a headache, we go to the hospital because we have a headache. But if a child says, I'm tired, is anybody here that, that the children's school in the boarding house and they've called you that, I don't want to go on again? Has anybody had that experience? I can't cope with this exam again. If you don't have it, you probably know somebody that has it. They just call you and say, I can't keep up. My head, I, I don't understand. I, I can't keep up. So many things are happening that they can't deal with pressure. There was a time Ayotemi, you called me. There was a time Ayotemi called me and said, Mommy, I'm overwhelmed. I'm tired. And I just, just said, take it easy. You know what? Take a shower. Listen to music. Do something that you enjoy doing. And later you can go back. And of course, the power of prayer. Never underestimate it. So there are times they're just confused. They don't know. There's some people that they don't even know what courses to read in university. Don't put them under pressure. What do you like? What are the interests? And it's not just about academics. Many children have A stars, but they're broken inside. Why? Because they want to thrive, but in their homes, mommy and daddy are always shouting at each other. So they're like, oh. Or maybe daddy goes to the pulpit to pray, but when he comes back, he beats mommy every day. They're confused. If you want to know something about yourself, ask your children. If you want to know the truth about yourself, ask your children. They will tell you the truth. Don't ask anybody outside. So when you get home today, look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, who am I? You might get something else in the mirror, but ask your children, how am I? How can I improve on parenting? And your children too will ask you, mommy, how can I improve to be a a good uh, a, a child that you, you want to admire, or something like that. The most important things for parents is to be function, uh, for our children to be functional, happy and joyful pe- children of the society. Let them learn skills. Let them learn things that will take them off the pressures of life. Let them be able to jog, to be able to play basketball and things like that. So basically, Dr. Shodimu is here. She's going to tell us within a second what she does She'll tell us a bit about herself. Charity Babatunde too is here. Anything social media and the internet, she'll tell you what it is that the children are facing. They're they're here to talk to us within one minute. Well, well, 30 seconds. Just tell us, please, 30, okay, one minute. Just tell us what you do and what the challenges of the youth are facing in in your spheres of life, basically. And uh, I want to recognize uh, Lagos mom, Yeti. Thank you for coming. Anybody that has passion for children, and you are here, please stand up. If you do, oh, you need to get up, please. If you have a passion for children, please stand up, record, Let's, so that you can talk to them. Please, stand up if you have a passion. Everybody look around. People that love children, that want to help children. People that you can share your stories with. Thank you, thank you very much. So what am I saying? I'm a listener. Many marriages are not working because we don't listen. Many children are getting upset with their parents because they say, My mom just doesn't listen. So Bimbo Shomolu is a listener. I listen. That's my job. And guess what? When I listen, I listen to what you say and what you don't say. And guess what? I provide support system because in what you're saying, by the time you express yourself, you've gotten the solution. So that's what I do. I listen. And I'm passionate about children because I know there's a treasure in each child. Once they come into this world, there's something they're going to come to do to impact the world. So it's the parent, the handler, and the environment that has a lot of influence on their lives. So we have to be able to manage them well. Dr. Shodimi, please, let's have one minute. Charity, have one more minute. After that, please throw the questions. I give back to Ayo Temi Shomolu and ask your questions. Be free to ask anything today. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Good afternoon or good evening now, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. I always like to share what I do because um, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, I work with Lagos State, that's Lut University Teaching Hospital. Thank you for allowing me to say this or come on board. So this is mental health. This, this is mental health at the state. But before I go to that, we have to realize that 
in as much as we get healed sometimes when we are not, um, we have malaria or we have some kind of um, chest infection, there's also a part of us that, that, that needs to be nourished. That is our mental well-being. So from all, I won't go over it again, what they've said, how you should confide in people, how you should have um, um, confidence, how you should talk to your parents, how you shouldn't withdraw from, from the society or from your family. Another part of that is when, um, when we become teenagers. It's just like when a child knows that now I can, I can walk, and then you see the child walking, running, and he doesn't care where he's running to. Just so the same when they become grown up and they are teenagers, like you've, they've lifted something on their eyes, and they can see clearly. But as parents, we want to channel them and they want to resist. Putting that aside, I want to talk about one of my experiences. Why I said this is mental health is all what we've discussed today would help us to keep our mental well-being. However, there's a part of it that even with all we've talked about, even after talking with someone, even after reaching out, even after doing everything we think we should do, after having that hot bath, after your mommy talking to you, it could still continue. So at that point, as parents and as the children too, we should know that maybe we need a professional help. The difference between sadness and depression is when you're sad, when you see something that um, will make you happy, you come out of it. Like for instance, if you like ice cream or if you see your mom, you feel happy. But with depression, no matter what, the person still has those feelings. They feel weak, they are not happy, they cannot reach out, they are with, to themselves. At those points, then they need professional help. Another part of it is most parents think that all what we do as psychiatrists is to give drugs. Yes, we do give drugs sometimes. However, we know how to navigate some things that you as a parent might not know how to handle. So we are there to help you. I work in LUT and there are so many other psychologists too that can help. All right. First of all, let me say to the panelists, well done. You know, when I was talking to Bim, sorry, my name is Charity Babatunde. I run a social enterprise called Rivatal. And when I was talking to Bimba, one of the things I said is that the young people inspire me so much. Amazing. And one of the things I like is your honesty and your boldness. Truth of matter is that there's so many things you talk about that we wish we could have talked about, but fear did not let us. And that's the honest truth. So what do I do? I work with young people. I work with parents. Yes, I do quite a bit in the space of social media. And the reason is because the arena in which we're raising our children has changed. And what has happened is, this is one, one of the things I say is, our children are um, natives and we are immigrants. And this is one situation where the immigrants have to take control. Because even though our children are native born to the social space, we must learn how we can parent them. Bimba talked about the fact that they have knowledge. Knowledge is everywhere. We actually live in a knowledge economy, but wisdom is what we possess. Therefore, as parents, if you say you're not on social media, you've missed it. If you say you're going to restrict or um, stop your children from getting in that space, you've also missed it. Because guess what? They're going to go there anyway. I was watching a film the other day, and I'll round up in one minute. And um, it was one of these American sitcoms, The Reunion, it's on Netflix. And the young boy was telling his sister that, no, he was telling his mom that, oh, your daughter is something, something on social media, on Instagram. She said, no, but she's on the fake Instagram account. She said, no, she has another Instagram that is fake to the fake, so that you think you actually have it. That's how intelligent that they are. But the truth of the matter is you will kill yourself if you say you want to be monitoring them 24-7, so don't bother. Two, you would also kill yourself if you want to follow them and stalk them. Don't bother. What you need to do and what we need to do is keep reinforcing the values that will help them make right choices in whatever space they're doing. Bimbo, well done. You're doing a fantastic job. Thank you so much to our lovely professionals. Now, back to our panelists with questions. Sexual preference for a Christian is not intolerance, but it is our belief and our faith. What do you have to say back to that person? Because that was a response to what you said. So what I said concerning tolerance is tolerance in terms of 
yeah, sexual preferences and, you know, picking whatever you want to necessarily, you know, believe in. I went to the UK and, you know, when I went to the UK, I saw different types of people, you know, some were gay, some were lesbian, some were bisexual. And, you know, coming from a country like Nigeria, which, you know, we don't accept these, you know, these values, these way of life. So ah, I'm confused. And the natural thing to do for me is to condemn this attitude. And the two years I've been in the UK, it's made me understand that um, religion is all about love. And regardless of whatever, you know, passion or path you, you know, choose to take, the most important thing is that you have love for people out there. So I may not understand why you decide you want to you know, go a certain way, but me as a Christian, I would love you, and I would accept you, and I would tolerate you. Woo! Um, I want to add to what Fiend said. Um, at the end of the day, um, if you want to make this um, sexual preference thing about Christianity, you see in the Bible that one of the greatest commandments of all time is for us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Uh, what I see with a lot of uh, adults when it comes to Christianity, they say the Bible says this and you're doing this, therefore this is wrong. And like they end up you know, showing hate towards these people just because of their sexual preference. But at the end of the day, what we are meant to do as Christians is to love, regardless. We're meant to love. And people put judging before loving. And that's one of the worst things you can do as a Christian. Because if you're trying to bring people over to your side and you're saying, you know, this is wrong, so I'm not going to accept you. It's literally just contradicting the whole idea of Christianity and loving other people. So I think what Finn was trying to say is that as a parent, if your children are going one way, you need to show them that you're going to love them regardless of whatever way they're going. So. Thank you guys for clearing that out. Uh, now this question says, is it better to learn from experience or to learn from your parents' instructions or what your parents tell you? In this generation, there's certain things that we would experience that maybe our parents didn't experience, like you said, due to the new age and social media. So in that sense, you have to learn it yourself, unfortunately. But um, in, in, like, you, like you mentioned before, parents have wisdom. So there's certain mistakes that our parents would have made that if we understand and learn from it, we wouldn't repeat the same mistakes. So in that sense, I would say you should learn from your parents. Sometimes it's good to learn from other people because you're not starting from the same point. Like someone said once, it's like you're standing on the person's shoulders. So you don't have the same starting point from where they are. But there's some things that you just have to experience. Because just like Miss Charity said right now, they, when your parents don't explain to you why they don't want you to do something, you don't understand why you shouldn't do it in the first place. So you just go ahead and do it, and then that's when you would learn from experience. I think that you, if you have both, like there's a situation, I want to make a decision, and you're like, I, have, I did this before, and my mom told me she did this before. I think you just have to combine both of them and make an evaluation. You have this, and you have this. Why choose one and be narrow-minded when you can use all the information you have available to you? One thing is not going to be what is exactly correct in that situation because every situation is different. What you faced before is not what you're facing now. What your mom said she faced is not what you're facing now. So add both of them and then make your decision. Okay, um, I was the first. Um, I, my friend introduced me to the whole um, thing about betting. And uh, <laughs> um, fortunately for me, I had, I think, 600 pounds in my account. And I saw that if I bet on this Barcelona and Liverpool game, that I will get triple that amount. And I'm just like, ah, which person, which sane human being wouldn't want to get triple the amount he has? And, you know, I wasn't, you know, sensible enough. I wasn't being my normal self that, oh, Fee, sit down. That does this make sense? What if you lose this money? But no, I was thinking about that money. What I can do with that money? What I'll buy with that money? Oh, I'll buy this Gucci shoe. I'll buy this and that. You know, I'll be able to show off and all of that. But then, I used that 600 pounds, and I lost it. I lost all that money. I couldn't tell my mom. I, 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 didn't, I didn't have the chance to tell my mom. My mom is at the back now. She's here now for the first time. <laughs> but I, I, didn't, I didn't have the chance to tell her because I, I couldn't even think about how she would react. You know, so those kind of things, you can't 
You can't compare the degree in which I would have learned from you telling me, don't bet, from me actually losing that money. Do you get? So I would never, not in the next world or the world before, ever even think about <laughs> betting again. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. I believe that parents should tell you about their experiences. Um, like Fiend said, yeah, there's some things that you should experience, but I feel like when your parents tell you, it kind of like can guide you and let you know, okay, so this is what they did and this, is what, this was the outcome, so I shouldn't do this. And I feel like at the same time, because my mom tells me, you know, this is what I did as a child, like I said, it makes you connect to your, to your parents. I know that, okay, they, they did the same things that we did, but also, it's also gotten to a point where my mom tells me, you know, don't do this. And sometimes I don't even have to ask her because I know that, you know, there's a reason behind it. There's a sensible reason behind it because of all the, um, you know, precedents. Because she's told me different things about it. So, sorry, different things, different situations. I know that my mom isn't just telling me don't do this because she doesn't want me to do it. Like, there's a sensible reason behind it. So I feel like in everything, yes, um, you should experience things. But at the same time, when, when you give your children, you know, your own stories that you've been through and stuff like that, it can help to guide them and bring a connection between you and your child. Thank you, Adapo. Now, when do you think it's okay for a child to get on social media? And what information is too much information for a child to share, for a child to see, and all of that on social media? I mean, me, for example, there's some personal family issues that I have that I've written about, but I've never shared it because it doesn't really concern me anymore. And if I were to share it, I need to take permission from the other parties involved because I don't think it's fair to put somebody else's business out there without at least informing them first. So I think at that point, it's too much information. Unless they tell you, you can go ahead if they're okay with it. But otherwise, you have to be... There's that fine line because sometimes I think people also overshare. You know, we have this new age where we just put everything online. So I think you just have to look at the fine line and see when it's okay to share. But don't hurt somebody else with your post. Answer something you asked. When do you think it's a good time to let a child go on social media? Um, honestly, as early as you feel, as early as you think is best. Sometimes you can start them off when they're seven, sometimes 12, sometimes 13. So as early as you think is best. But then when is it right for you to share certain things like that with them? I'll give an example. I, I don't really have the best answer for that, but I can give one example that I know. A friend of mine, her mom, recently started her eight-year-old brother on sexual, on sexual education. Her brother is eight. She got him a book on what the vagina is, what the penis is, how eggs and sperm fertilize. And this is an eight-year-old asking his sister, what is a vagina? I am as surprised as anyone else because I know when I was eight, heavens and hell, my mother would not let me see so much as one speck of that. But... Because she didn't do that when I was younger, I, ex I got to, I, got, I had my own curiosities that led me to then wanting to know what this is, what that is, and I started experiencing it on my own. But when, now the thing is with my friend, now that her brother is learning it, and she's the firstborn, she can give him answers to certain things that at my age I would not have had. And he would know certain things to avoid when he's older, that if I didn't know then, I would have learned it on my own later on and then would have gone through something that would have been very drastic or dramatic at that point in time. So that's why I say, for, that's why I say when is it right to let them see certain things? It depends on you as a parent when you feel, you know what, as, you know, as a parent, I feel like if I let my child into this and explain this thing to them and guide them through this, when they're older, they'll be able to properly understand these things and know what to do and what to not do. So that poor. Uh, we've noticed that social media first started as a way for all of us to connect, yeah? And Joko, you mentioned something along the lines of your friend saying that she has social anxiety because she prefers to, you know, text and, you know, it's, back, it's for you, Dalapo, but Joko mentioned. So, what, what do you feel the effect of social media has on mental health in regards to, like, depression and anxiety? How do you feel it affects people socially? You mentioned something before in regards to compar comparison. And I think that's one of the first things I've noticed about social media. Social media creates the platform for individuals to compare themselves. We have access to so many information and seeing the lives of so many different people globally. So, like you said, and comparison is really the thief of joy. So it really does create, um, I guess it, 
the seeds of doubt in yourself. Will I be successful? Will I be rich? Will I be good enough? Things like that. Um, I think another thing we need to realize is that you're comparing your everyday life to somebody's highlights or somebody's, you know, like the good parts. I, I think I shared this the last time. One of my classmates from Queen's College, she was a virgin ambassador. So I think she told me herself, I think she got like 12 upper class cabin tickets every year. So you see her flying and like, ah, ah, every time, like you, and his upper cabin as well, like, see this life that this girl is chopping. So, you know, I can't, I can't lie. There was a time I used to compare myself to her because it's like, we went to QC together. We finished the same year. Truly, truly, does she have two heads? How come she's living this kind of lifestyle? But I didn't also realize that, hello, I'm comparing myself to her highlights. Her everyday life is not always as glamorous as it looks. So we have to be very careful about that. When I first got on social media, I was, you know, that was way back when it was to go, you know, high five, which a lot of, which I guess some people here probably have never experienced. Be happy you didn't experience any of these things. Or MySpace, those days. Yeah, high five. Yeah, I use high five. <laughs> um, I remember always looking at other people's and always wondering, why don't I have this many followers? Why don't these many, why don't, you know, why aren't these many people looking at my profile the way they're looking at this person's profile? It gave me this inferiority complex that was really bad that I would actually just stay in a little box of my own, which my box at that time was my room. I would stay in my room, I'd not want to come out. Or if I come out, I'd probably just not really talk as much because I feel like, you know, whatever I'm going to say, I'm not going to be as good as a person who has, a, who has you know, more followers or better pictures or, you know, looks better than me. And these are the problems that you get from social media. But like, you know, like I said before and she reiterated, sometimes you should not compare yourself to someone else's, you know, whatever you see on someone else's social media page. A lot of us here are hoping, you know, yo, I want to have six million followers. I want to be as, you know, I want to have as many followers as Beyonce, you know, have skin as good as Kim Kardashian. That's their life. It's their lives. You know, they know what they're going through before you see all these good pictures and everything. You're not going through the same things. You need to focus on what you're going through at that point in time to get your best self out. Not, be, not try to make yourself look like Kim Kardashian or have as many followers as this other person. As much as they may be positives, they are also very much negatives. Thank you, Laji. Okay, so something that um, I've really kept on myself for a long time is the fact that Every, literally everybody in this life is going through something. Like, that's just a fact we need to accept. So when you're comparing yourself to other people, it's not going to do anything for you. Like, one of the things I struggle the most with, the, with social media is that, first of all, my favorite app to use is Instagram. And that app is like, the main thing on it is just posting pictures. And there are some times I'll just go on Instagram, I'm just looking at different people. Like, my generally, generally, I'm a very confident person on my own, but, once I start comparing myself to other people, I feel so like insecure, um, and I start to you know question you know different things about myself. But it took me a while to realize that you know this is you. It's all you. Like you, you comparing yourself to other people is what's bringing your confidence down. Because I believe that you know I'm a, an amazing person. But when I see other people, it like kind of brings that down for me. So when you say when you ask that, oh, when when is the right age to bring your child to social media and stuff like that. I don't really think that there's a right age, but like your child needs to be able to be confident in themselves before you put them out there because social media is a very scary place. Like it might not even be you putting yourself down, but it might be other people putting you down through comments or let's say I have a friend who like likes and comments, like if she doesn't have likes and comments, she feels like, she goes crazy. And it's, it's, it can be very harmful to people who are still growing up so, um, or who are still building their confidence. So I feel like it doesn't have to do with age. It has to do with, with you know, your, where you are mentally at the time. I don't know if anyone else has noticed, but social media has made my attention span, like, reduced. Like, yes. <laughs> so things like, I used to be able to watch maybe, like, a a whole movie without going on my phone. But now, due to social media, I can be multitasking. So I can be watching a movie, but be on Instagram at the same time or on Twitter. So I think attention span is something as well that it's affected. So, yeah. So it's all about balance. Anyway, thank you so much to our panelists. Give them a round of applause. Now, this part is pretty exciting for me. I will be welcoming Ms. Isoke Aruwede and John Obasi Kalu for a spoken word session. 
Um, the title of their performance is Problems We Youth Face. Please give them a round of applause. Do you ever do anything without pressing your phone? I beg, leave me, that's my problem. Just leave me alone. All these problems, I swear, they've got my brain in Iraq. Girlfriend, your problem is day for your back. I have way more problems than a voluptuous behind. Well, let's hear it then. What problems have you been unfortunate to find? I'm expected to be everything. They want me to be slim, yet they want me to be thick. That's hard. Be independent, they tell you to stand. Yet everyone be asking, honey, where's your man? So I see this cute guy and he's looking interested. He's got nothing upstairs though. But for the gram, I'll invest in it. Hmm? You do it for the gram? I always do it. Education, Nunko. I bet that's serious to you. Oh, true. Read your books, do well in school. But have a mad social life, else you won't be considered cool. So I'm expected to juggle beauty with brains and sexiness at this stage. Well, that's your business. Who sent you a message? There's too much pressure to move as the times crack. Yesterday it was front, tomorrow it's back. Now, apparently yellow is the new black. Is my waist a cutie enough for you? In the name of beauty, what do I have to do? Perhaps I'll be a slay queen looking snatched to take away. Snatched away to take. But I hope it's all natural before they call you fake. <laughs> they already do. Gossips be acting like my fans. I'm supposed to act like a woman and think like a man. That's the problem we face in this tough men's zone. We expect it to be united, but yet we still walk alone. Are you not a man? What is um, fearing you? Living without emotions, and yet you still expect me to be more masculine to you. I'm supposed to be all strong, carrying the world around my shoulders, and yet, if you see one tear from my eyes... Stop it. Are you a girl? Find a hot girl and she better be a 10, yet everyone sees me. I want to use my ATM, so leave me to slam as many teeth as I can. My guys be hailing, ah, don't know you're the man. So you're stressing to impress him? Ah, the pressure is real. I mean, booze is really bitter. It's a sticky one still. Lil Block, do you smoke? Ah, only quietly, not loud. And how's your family doing? Uh, change the subject, I'm not proud. Mistreated. Misunderstood, misplaced. Miss Picture Perfect Good, I am oh, really fine with what you see. Take a look at what I wore out. You cannot be comfortable in that. Admit it, you're just chasing clouds. I am not depressed. <sighs> if you were, you would admit it. I admit I, I just want to be seen. And be accepted in it. I just want to break the rules for no particular reason. Get yourself a disguise then, or say it in season. Why wouldn't they hang out with me? Why would they validate me? Why wasn't I invited to that party? Why would they just let me be? You know what I need? I need to be popular. I need to be grown. I think I want to drive the coolest car. I need to be blown. I need to be pretty. I need to be hard. I need to be trendy. I need some more bars. Yes, I need money. A lot of money. Ridiculous money. Money, money, money. 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 It's so funny in a young guy's world. And it's going to take more than daddy's allowance to maintain this girl. Well, I heard you got that with that guy next door. That's none of your business. What are you asking that for? Was that really what you wanted or not or no? No, but... I don't want to get in trouble, so let's keep it on the low. Can you see that all we want is to feel wanted? We clearly need support. We're actually pretty chilled underneath all this hurt. We are young like the day, but we got issues as dark as the night. It might take us a lifetime to get anything right. Try, Try to, to understand, understand that, that I, I don't understand, understand but, but I can't stand to have you stand and tell me that, that I, don't, I understand. don't understand. I just want to be loved. That's it. Mm. But do you even know what love is? Can I be conscious of who I am? I'm more than what they see. You mean a strong sense of self? Perhaps it's a journey itself, discovery, or if I will. You mean like hot girl summer? Well, something deeper or 
will. You mean like be my biggest fan and love me for who I am. And live in content because proving your worth is all I am. So you mean I should be optimistic about my failures and open-minded to my confusion. Like honestly, who really has it put together? Everything is just simple illusion. Okay. I'll invest in myself. I am a vessel of potential. With plenty of value to add, that is very essential. So I'll forget my issues for a moment and I'll dance away the pain. With loud music and provocative grinding? No, that's not what I'd say. I'd say we open up our hearts and minds because we only have one life to live. And even though we're still young, dumb, and broke, we, we still, still got, got love, love to, to give. give. YOLO. YOLO. Thank you. Thank you so much to It's OK and John. Please give them another round of applause. Now we have come to the end of our Youth Speak Up 2. So I just want to thank all of you so, so much for coming. I'm, I feel so honored to have been the moderator for today. And I'm so proud of the turnout. So thank you so much. Um, thank you to our media team, our staff, uh, everyone who has been involved. Our panelists, please give our panelists a round of applause. You guys were amazing. And I'm so proud of you. And thank you all again for being a part of our journey. Uh, this year, we've taken our Youth Speak Up campaign to Ongo State Public Schools summer programs and Enugu State private organizations. And we're really passionate about this, so we would like to take this all across Nigeria. So your support is so essential for us. We really appreciate it. Um, I think it was really lovely and I'm really glad that I came with the children, not just send them. I think it's something that um, families should make priority. We definitely will be here next time, so thank you very much to the organizers. Thank you. Uh, the program was very enlightening, very, very educative. It was a very good show. Um, I loved listening to all the everybody on the panel. You know, it's always very interesting to hear the perspective of other people and I've learned a lot today. I learned that people should be tolerant no matter which path you're supposed to take and that parents should be more understanding with their children. No matter what, you should talk to your parents because your parents might have experiences similar to what you're experiencing now. So you can't just keep everything bottled up and say that, oh, your parents will understand. You should at least try to talk to them to see if they would understand what you're going through.